Hi, I'm Ben, welcome back to my channel. Today I've got another reading vlog for you. This time you're gonna come on holiday with me to Ireland and then to the Hay Festival in Wales. I'm actually coming to you from the future. Well, not the future, but after the events of this reading vlog, because I originally filmed a bit of an introduction while I was packing and I was trying out some new microphones and unfortunately the audio at the start of that footage at least turned out to be utter garbage. Thankfully, it did get a little bit better, and I think we're going to join that footage just after I've described how this isn't technically my first trip to Ireland, because I once got a party bus from Belfast, which is in Northern Ireland, down to Dublin, which is in the Republic, obviously. But along the way, people got a little bit too drunk, maybe were sick. Not me, by the way. And we got as far as swords before we had to turn back. So I haven't really set foot on Irish soil, and I was very excited for my first proper trip. So I'm going to hand you over to me and then you'll see the contents of the reading vlog and then you will come back to me and I'll tell you all about Hay Festival and show you a few books that I picked up while I was there. But yeah, I've never really taken in the beauty of those rolling green hills of the Emerald Isle. So I'm excited to go and see it for real this time. And while I'm there, I am keen to read some Irish fiction. So I thought I'd run you through some of the contenders for what's going to come with me. The first one that I'm thinking about taking is Penenka by Ronan Hessian, which has a gorgeous cover. I love a cover that's like an oil painting. It looks really cool. This is a book that I picked up on a recent reading vlog when I did the Bristol Bookshop Crawl. It feels like it has the potential to be heartwarming, but it also feels like it has the potential to crush your heart. So it'll be interesting to see which one of those turns out to be true. It is quite short. So yeah, maybe I will take that one and then I will almost certainly be able to finish it while I'm away. Speaking of short books, I've also got Claire Keegan's Foster, which is, to be honest, a glorified short story, just like small things like these. And that sounds more shady now that I've said it out loud, but I think everyone was hyping up small things like these. And while I did enjoy it, I thought it was a nice story. It didn't blow me away, but I thought the writing was nice. I'm willing to give Claire Keegan another go. And I've heard great things about Foster. This is one that potentially... I will just get through on the plane. So I see no reason why it can't come with me. Those were the short ones out of the way. The other three that I am thinking about are real chunksters. And so I'm not entirely sure that any of them are going to come because they will take up so much space in my bag. But the first one is Marion Key's Grown Ups. It's got a beautiful shade of green on the cover. Or is that turquoise or teal? I don't know. If someone knows what color that is, let me know. This one is about three women who are married to three brothers. There is fun and partying and mystery. Apparently it's quite Austin-esque, which sounds interesting. Comic convincing and true, says The Guardian. It's always nice to have something a little bit funny and light while you're on holiday. I think if I was going to the beach, this would 100% be coming with me, but I don't know if we're going to go anywhere near a beach. I've never read any Marion Keys, but I've heard such wonderful things about her writing and what she does. I am keen to get to this. This might just not be the time. Then we have uh, Tana French's The Witch Elm. And I picked this up from eBay because Grace at GK Reads, I think in a video, she said this is her favorite thriller. I don't read tons of thrillers, but I do like to read one when I'm on holiday. Oh wow, the font is smaller than I expected. I thought it was going to be quite big. This is a 500 page novel and the font is, I guess, standard size. There's a lot to get through in here, but we have got a comparison on the back here to Donna Tartt's The Secret History, which does heighten my interest somewhat because I love The Secret History. It's a fantastic book. Yeah, an engrossing thriller is great for the plane. Because I'm not a, I'm not a great flyer, I'll be honest. I do not like being in one of those little tin cans, thirty thousand feet in the sky, which is silly because I've got a friend who's a pilot and he is up in the sky every day or like four days out of every seven. But still, I am not reassured for some reason. This book does also have a quote from John Boyne on the front who calls it a masterpiece. And speaking of John Boyne. The other book that I'm considering is The Heart's Invisible Furies. Set in Dublin, it's a cradle to grave story about a little boy called Cyril and I think his life and how he comes to terms with his sexuality seems like a book that has the capacity to break you. And I love being emotionally dismantled by a book. So this might be right up my street, but it is a mammoth one. It's like 700 plus pages. The font is quite big, but that is still a lot of 
pages. I have no idea. I think I am tempted just to take the two little ones and then that gives me less to lug around and also a bit more flexibility because I've been eyeing up some bookshops and there's one in Limerick where we're going and one in Galway. And I want to pop in at least one of them and I thought it'd be fun to buy a book by an Irish author set in Ireland while I'm in Ireland. And then if I can read it while I'm there, well, I believe that's called good crack. So yeah, anyway, I better finish playing luggage Jenga and see if I can stuff everything I need into my bag. And then I will check in with you again once I get there. Hello. Right. So it's been a few days now. And uh, if I'm sounding a little bit hoarse, it's because the Irish know how to drink at a wedding. So I've had more than a few pints of Guinness. We're just in the second place that we've stayed. So the cast we went to was super, super fancy. It was so beautiful. We had like nice woodland walks around there. And then we've moved on to this little town about an hour away from there where we went to this old traditional Irish pub last night for the day after celebrations. And it was really good fun. There was lots of traditional Irish music like Steps and S Club 7. So that was great. We're just packing up, actually, because we're about to move on to Limerick, which is a couple of hours south from where we are. And to be honest, I haven't had tons of time for reading so far. But I have made a start on Penenka by Ronan Hessian. And I'm really enjoying it. I thought this was going to be some interior view of Penenka's perspective, but it's actually full third person omniscient narration. And we sort of look closely over the shoulder of a few different characters. So we've got Penenka's point of view, but we've also got his daughter, Marie Therese, and a bunch of other people around the town that they live in. And the language is quite simple, but it's also quite beautiful. It's pretty straightforward. I have noticed that there's quite a bit of tell rather than show, like characters, emotions and motivations being very blatantly stated. But it's really working for me. That's normally a little bit of a turn off. And I know it's a big no, no when you're a writer, but I think it it's working quite well. And the story so far feels very melancholy. Penenka's going through something that I won't spoil um, and it's making him really reflect on life. So I'm really interested to see where it goes. I'm about a third of the way through so far, hoping to finish this um, in the next day or two, especially now that all the wedding party have cleared off and we've got some chill out time. I definitely do not plan on drinking anything for at least a couple of days. So I'll be able to focus more on a little bit of reading, a little bit of relaxing. Anyway, I'll show you what we get up to in Limerick with some clips. And I'm not sure if I'll check in with you there or maybe not until we get to Galway in a couple of days time. But yes, very excited for the next chapter of the book and the next chapter of the holiday. So see you in a bit.
again and greetings from Galway, our fourth and final stop on our trip of Ireland. And I think we might have saved the best till last because we arrived yesterday and my first impressions are that is absolutely stunning. It's this uh, little city that's quite compact, built around a bay. So you've got beautiful views of the water. The weather has been absolutely stunning. So we spent quite a lot of time outside. We're staying in the Latin Quarter, which is kind of like the heart of the old city. So there's cobbled streets, there's bunting across the road, and there's just lots of stuff going on, lots of places to eat and stuff like that. So we're having a rather lovely time. The hotel we're staying in is really cool and nicely designed, but we have ended up in a room that has no windows. So it's really weird and hard to gauge what sort of time of day it is and stuff like that. I feel like I'm in a casino. Anyway, what I wanted to catch up with you on was the fact that before I left Limerick, I popped to a bookshop there called O Mahoney's, which I found when I was doing a little bit of research and it came up as one of the best bookshops in Ireland and it was pretty cool i think it was an indie bookshop but it didn't have like an indie bookshop vibe it felt more like a waterstones it was quite big and yeah it was fun just to have a little bit of a mooch around one thing that was really interesting to me that i noticed was that there weren't many hardback books at all so all of their new release books which we expect in the uk to be in hardback and i think that's the same in the us as well were actually in these like larger format paperbacks which I have looked up and are called trade paperbacks, but I would normally call them airport editions because the only place you can get them in the UK is when you're passing through an airport. So that was kind of strange. I did ask the lady in the shop about that and she said something about there being a paper shortage during COVID. So I'm not sure if that has anything to do with it or if it's a longer standing tradition than that, but it was quite strange to have all these massive paperbacks. Anyway, my mission when I visited O'Mahony's was to get some more Irish fiction. And let me tell you, that was not difficult because there are so many Irish authors that I hadn't really considered. Authors like John Bamville, Sebastian Barry, Edna O'Brien, Colin McCann, Colin Tabeen, Sarah Baum, Anne M. Wright, Emma Donoghue, even Maggie O'Farrell, which even Maggie O'Farrell, which surprised me because I've been to see her speak and I could not find a trace of an Irish accent, but apparently she's from Northern Ireland. But yeah, there's this rich literary history in Ireland that I had not really fully appreciated. And so it was really cool to see that when I approached and browsed through the Irish literature shelves. So the only problem I had was which book to get. And I ended up getting three books. One of them was an author that I've been wanting to read for a while, which is Donal Ryan. And this is The Spinning Heart, which is his first novel, which I think came out in 2012 or 2013 but was long listed for the Booker in 2013. It is set in the aftermath of the late noughties financial crisis, and it's a view of a particular town in Ireland and the fallout and consequences of that for the people of this town. The structure of it seems really interesting, so each chapter is from the perspective of a different character, a different person who lives in the town. And so across all of these, you build up a picture of the effects of the financial crisis it's quite a short little novel so so i was quite taken by it i spent far too long actually browsing through the different donal ryan books uh, but i thought why not start at the beginning what a very good place to start so that was my one backlist book that i picked up and then i did go for two more recent novels which came in this strange trade paperback format the first one is service by sarah gilmartin and this is about a woman that learns a chef that she worked for when she worked in a restaurant, I think in Dublin, uh, is accused of sexual assault. And I think this is a book that has a number of different perspectives that are all competing to tell a truthful narrative. That is something that's really appealed to me lately. And this has got very good reviews. I'm really interested in reading it. There are not enough books about restaurants and the service industry and kitchens and that always really intrigued me what goes on behind the scenes. So I am keen to give this a read. It feels like a good post Me Too book. The final book that I picked up was Claire Kilroy's Soldier Sailor. Not too wild about the cover and it's absolutely huge. I'm sure this is bigger than the hardback is in the UK, but we can forgive it for that if what's inside is beautifully written. And I've heard that it is very beautifully written. The only thing I really know about this other than uh, it's lovely writing, is that it is Claire Kilroy's first novel in a decade. And it's and it's basically a bit of a monologue from a mother to a son. And I think it covers some 
pretty heavy topic. So it's about the tumultuous early days of motherhood. So potentially covering stuff like postnatal depression. I think it might be quite a zippy read and maybe I'll try and get to this before I leave Ireland. So yeah, those are the three books that I picked up from O'Mahony's. And if you're ever in the area in Limerick, I'd recommend dropping by. The other thing I wanted to update on was that I finished uh, Ronan Hessian's Penenka. So to nutshell this book, although it is titled Penenka, it is basically the story of Penenka and his family, and by extension, the town that they live in in Ireland. And what we get over the course of the book are all of these characters coming to terms with the things that are really getting to them. So Marie Therese and Vincent's relationship isn't quite working. Penenka is very regretful of what he experienced in his football career. And there definitely is a lot of football in this book, although I don't think it dominates the book. I think it's more backdrop and you don't need to be a football fan and you don't need to be put off if you don't like football. It's just a device used to create this situation for Penenka and how he's regarded by the town that he lives in. Overall, I didn't think it was like exceptionally well written. It's quite simply written. Some of the characters maybe have a bit more wisdom than I would expect. Everyone talks in a very wise way. But despite some quite heavy subject matter and difficult relationships, it never felt depressing. And so it was quite an uplifting read. There was a lot of hope and optimism, I think, in this book. And although there wasn't complete resolution for everyone by the end of the book, I still felt satisfied by the outcomes. So I thought it was really well done and I would be open to reading some more of Ronan Hessian's work in the future. We've got a couple of days left in Galway now and I've heard that there are some good bookshops here as well. So I might try and pop into those despite the beautiful sunshine urging us to spend as much time outside as possible. But yeah, I'll probably update once we are home now. So see you on the other side. We are home, but not for long. We got back this afternoon, but we're only home for about 24 hours. Actually, probably quite a bit less than 24 hours, but we're off to Hay Festival tomorrow. So we are just trying to unpack, wash the clothes we need, repack and get ready to leave in the morning. But yeah, overall, Galway was absolutely stunning. It was a really fun little city to go to. And I wish we had longer there, to be honest, because although it's quite small and there's not tons to explore, you can just like while away the hours sitting on the seafront, especially when the weather is as good as it was while we were there. And man, the coastline was just stunning. We did these really beautiful sunset walks where you could just see across the uh, ocean and it was yeah, just really lovely. Thought I'd give you a quick update on reading I've been doing since my last little chat with you. And I read Claire Keegan's Foster over the course of a couple of hours, just in one day, really. I didn't know what to expect with this because, as I mentioned, I didn't massively get on with small things like these. I think I just found that story 
a little bit too slight. And I think the story of the Magdalene laundries or Magdalene laundries, I'm not sure, whatever they are. I think that's a really meaty thing and there's a much bigger story that could have been told about them. And it was maybe also a little bit male saviory. But Foster, on the other hand, I think is really perfectly suited to this novella slash short story type of approach. It tells the story of, I think, an unnamed little girl whose family are going through a little bit of a difficult time and struggling to make ends meet. And so she is carted off for the summer to spend time with her aunt and uncle. And there is this subtext in a lot of what's not said. The story's told from the perspective of the young girl. I think it's in present tense. Um, yes, it is. And so what we get is sort of her naive perspective. And as readers, we then pick up on these subtle cues and little hints of what's happened before this summer for her aunt and uncle. And it's this really quite melancholy, it's kind of sad, but also a little bit hopeful and a little bit joy filled. In a way, quite similar to Panenka in tone. All the characters felt very real to me. I think the dialogue was much stronger than in Panenka. And I love what Claire Keegan's done here. It's very subtle, it's very nuanced, it's a small story, but a very poignant one. It's super precise and really rather beautiful. So I'd recommend that one. I've since moved on to one I showed you that I picked up in Limerick, which is Claire Kilroy's Soldier Sailor. And so far, it is living up to expectations. The writing is very beautiful. There's an enormous tension in the book. This balance of love and frustration and how those two things collide in the early days of motherhood. And I'm really enjoying it. I haven't got very far through so far, but what she's done in the scenes that I have read, just paint these scenes of something quite simple, like going to the supermarket and she's put into it all this tension and frustration and, and I didn't know going to the supermarket could be so tense, but it would seem when you are carrying a baby around that is not very cooperative, it can be a very tense environment. And so I am loving it. I wish I made a little bit more progress. I'm only 55 pages in and I was gonna blast through a bunch on the plane, but I'm not very good at flying. I don't love flying. And so I spent more time like gripping the seat and telling myself everything's gonna be all right than I did reading and enjoying. A book. So yeah, I will carry on reading this one and I'll either let you know what I think of it later on in this video or perhaps in my next wrap up. The other thing of note is that I hadn't planned on going in any bookshops in Galway, but it turns out they have some lovely bookshops. And so I went to three, which were all quite close together. So it makes for a nice little bookshop crawl. The first shop I went to, I cannot for the life of me remember the name of it, but it was quite a big shop, quite a commercial shop had a lot of books in there and confirmed my suspicions, discovery about the absence of hardbacks in the Irish market, which was really interesting. And it meant Matt and I had this entire discussion at lunch about the publishing industry and why hardbacks exist and how long it is between hardbacks and paperbacks and what the purpose of hardbacks is. But we had actually no idea of our own. So we were just theorizing. So if anyone out there is in the publishing industry and can enlighten us, I would love to hear what the hell is going on? Why do hardbacks exist? Is it just to get an idea of how big the print run for a paperback should be? Is it because you can charge more and so you can get a bit more of a return on investment? Let me know. Anyway, the first shop I went to, I didn't buy anything. And actually the second shop I went to, I didn't buy anything either. I think that one was called Dub Ray. And that was quite cool. It had like a nice selection of different books. It had buy one, get one half price offer. And I was tempted, but I didn't want to pick up any more new release books. The gem of Galway though, was the third shop I went to, which was Charlie Burns. When I was researching, I didn't think I would be that interested in Charlie Burns because it looked mostly like a secondhand bookshop. And for better or for worse, I am a little bit precious about my books and I like to keep them really pristine. So most of my shelves look like the books haven't been read. And so secondhand books are brilliant for affordability, but I find it hard to bring myself to buy and read a tattered book. But anyway, Charlie Burns was this really beautiful old dusty shop that felt a little bit like a library. And it had a mixture of its new release books, but also new backlist books. 
as well as, I don't really know how to describe these books, but you know in some bookshops they have a load of books that publishers must just be offloading and they're new copies, but they might be like slightly strange editions or American editions. And often they'll have like little red dots on the bottom of the, of the book. I don't know what is going on there, but those shops exist. And if you know, you know, if you don't, I'm probably sounding like I'm talking absolute nonsense. And then they also had a bunch of secondhand books, this entire room of fiction, floor to ceiling, and quite high ceilings as well. So there were little stools if you needed to get up high. Just basically a shed load of used books in different states and conditions. And so I scoured every single shelf and I was so tempted to buy loads of books but then I realized I needed to get these all back home somehow so I ended up getting three and the first one which was really exciting considering I've just finished Penenka I managed to find a copy of Ronan Hessian's previous novel and I think his debut novel Leonard and Hungry Paul and most excitingly I just nabbed a signed copy of it so this was six euros so not super cheap like charity shops near me sell books for 50p. But for about a fiver, I got a signed book in a pretty perfect condition. And I didn't know much about this, to be honest. I did a quick Google while I was there just to make sure it wasn't going to be something completely uh, uninteresting to me. But it's about these two quiet, gentle friends who are sort of weathering the storms of the 21st century. And they have jokes with each other, they play board games, they're a bit nerdy. The general consensus about the book is that it seems to be a very nice book and I don't read enough nice books. I know people have been doing the Misery May readathon, but I seem to do Misery 12 months of the year. I'm always reading something depressing, partly because it affects me a bit more and I like to be affected by a book, uh, but I should probably have more joy in my life. And so maybe this will be a nice book to get to when I'm feeling a little bit sad. So there was that one. The other Irish author I bought was a mint condition copy of Colin McCann's Aparag A Paragon. A Paragon. Really hard to say. So this is a book that was shortlisted, longlisted, longlisted for the Booker Prize uh, in 2020. I think it's a book about the Israel-Palestinian conflict. Yeah, it's two guys who live in Jerusalem and they are worlds apart. And I think this has got some clever vignette structure where it's told in something like a thousand vignettes and it counts up um, to 500 and then back down again. I'm not too familiar with what this book is about beyond that, but I've heard it's very powerful. I heard him talk about this on Open Book back when it was released, and it seems like it's really well researched. It's got, I think, real events threaded in as well as sort of fictionalized versions of, of what's been going on in that conflict. So it's a bit of a chunkster, but maybe I will make time for it at some point. I say that with every book I get though. The cover is quite nice and, and shiny and lovely as well. So if nothing else, it will look nice on the shelf. And then the final book I got was the only non-Irish book that I got on my trip. And that was uh, another mint condition copy, but The Reluctant Fundamentalist by Mosin Hamid. This was Mosin Hamid's first book? or at least his first novel. And this was also shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize in 2007. It's a one-sided conversation about terrorism and fundamentalism told in the shadow somewhat of 9-11. I have heard people say that this is his best book. And so I'm really interested to find out for myself because I really loved Exit West. And then I didn't particularly love The Last White Man. I feel like this has the potential to be a book I love um, and it's quite short, so it's not very hard to find out. So yeah, three new books. I'm really glad I didn't max out my luggage on the way out because otherwise I would not be getting those home without paying Ryanair an absolute fortune. But yeah, that's the island trip over. But the fun doesn't stop here. We are off to Hay on Wai for the Hay Festival tomorrow. We don't have tickets for much stuff tomorrow, but we are gonna go canoeing in the daytime in the beautiful sunshine. And then we're going to the Eurovision book contest tomorrow evening, which will be fun. And then there's a comedy night, which we've also booked into. And then we've got tickets for a few more things on Saturday, which is my birthday. And I'm just all round, really looking forward to it. And I'm not doing the driving, so that would be nice. And then once I'm back, I'll do one final little catch up with you. But right now, I really need to pack. So go on, clear off.
hello, welcome back. If you're still watching, thank you and well done. You've made it to the final furlong. I just wanted to, I guess, round off this video by sharing my thoughts about Hay Festival and as promised, tell you about a couple of books that I did pick up there. You will have seen in the clips that before we actually went into the festival, we organised to go canoeing along the River Wye, which was really cool, actually. It was lovely conditions for it generally. It was quite warm, but not too hot. But I will say that the river was very, very low. And so we were trundling along, often hitting and scraping a lot of rocks along the way. And when there's two of you in the boat and you've got one one ended paddle each, it's actually quite difficult to coordinate and navigate. So we were trying our best to stay in the deeper water, but it was quite hard at times. And there were moments where we were just like, turn left, turn left, uh, and we did not turn left. And so at one point we were like nose two feet up in the air and we had to use quite a lot of force and willpower and let's be honest, patience with one another to get unstuck and keep on moving. But yeah, it was a lovely couple of hours and we had a well-earned beer at the end of it before we headed into the actual main event, which was the Hay Festival. Before Hay, to be honest, the only festival that I've ever been to is Glastonbury. So as you'd expect, it was very different scale, different vibe. And when I first got there, I was actually surprised to see a lot of it was covered. And so I was a bit like, what is this? There were some lovely areas to sit outside, but given how hot it was, it was actually quite nice that there was plenty of shade. My overall reflection of it though, that it was just a wonderful place to be somewhere around so many book lovers and to celebrate literature in all of its forms, sharing ideas, talking about craft. I really loved being in that environment. We did go to quite a few events. And I think one reflection is that we crammed like six events into two days. And I almost wish we'd booked a little bit less or booked it across a few more days and stayed a bit longer so that there was just that chill out time in between talks to sit and read or do nothing or have a coffee. The events I did go to though, I really enjoyed. So on the first day we were there, we went in the evening and went to a Eurovision book contest event, which was an official partnership with the Eurovision Song Contest. And basically what they had was this long list of books that had been nominated by, I think the public, um, but curated by some experts, which had one book to represent each country that is a participant in the Eurovision Song Contest. And the discussion was a panel that were just talking about the different types of books that were there. They were talking about translation. They were talking about, I guess, the political context of a lot of these books. They didn't get to talk about all, I think, 37 books, but they touched on a few. And there were a few that I definitely took away and added to my TBR, including one called The Grey House. And I can't remember who the author was, but it sounded really interesting. And it was like some 700 page Donatar-esque epic from, I think, Armenia. But if I get that wrong, I'm gonna edit this out. <laughs> that was great. Then we went to a comedy night, which really had nothing to do with books, but it was just three comedians who were all really good. I particularly loved Bridget Christie, who I'd never heard of, but she was so, so funny. And I would definitely go and see her again. And then on the Saturday, we had quite a few events lined up. The first one was to see Marina Hyde, who's a Guardian columnist. And she talks a lot about, I guess, the absolute nonsense that goes on in British politics at the moment. And her book, is called What Just Happened, which is a collation of all of her columns in The Guardian. And apparently it's very funny. I do read her column now and again. She has a really interesting and clear-eyed take on just the absolute nonsense that goes on. And it is very amusing to read. So if you're feeling depressed about British politics, I'd recommend giving her column a go because at least you get a chuckle out of it. Then we went to see Peter Frankopan, who is an Oxford professor who's released this 700 page tome uh, called The Earth Transformed, which is a bit of a deep time view of climate change. And it works its way from the Big Bang right up to the modern day. It was really interesting to hear someone so informed on the climate emergency speak about these issues if a bit depressing. And one fact that has kind of stuck with me since is that we're going through an extinction event now where species are going extinct at a faster rate than after the asteroid hit that wiped out the dinosaurs, which seems absolutely unfathomable, like 
almost too ridiculous to be true. But that's what the science tells us, and it's terrifying. There was actually one slightly funny moment where Israel and Palestine was mentioned during the course of the talk, and someone stood up and said, can you stop? And everyone sort of held their breath and thought there was some political objection going on. But actually it turned out that someone had just fainted because it was so hot in the tent, and they were escorted out and thankfully were all okay. But it was a very odd moment and led to a lot of nervous chuckling from the audience. Finally, and maybe I've saved the best till last here, but I went to see Dua Lipa interviewing Douglas Stewart, author of Shiggy Bane and Young Mungo, for her podcast and book club, Service 95. And to my surprise, none other than Booktube's own Jack Edwards popped up to do the introduction and then share the Q&A. I think mainly just to protect Dua Lipa from fan questions about her music, which he did a very admirable job of. I'm sure it was a very daunting gig and he did very well. But yeah, Dua Lipa is great. She asked some really thoughtful questions. I love seeing pop culture icons and role models really clearly love reading and promote it among their fan base. And Douglas Stewart, my goodness, what an absolutely lovely man. He handled every question with grace and wisdom. He just seemed like such a nice guy. And I have to admit, I wasn't a huge Shuggy Bane fan. I thought it was a good book, but it didn't blow me away in quite the same way that a lot of other readers have experienced. But seeing Douglas Stewart talk about it has maybe opened me up to it a little bit more. And I am potentially going to go into Young Mungo with a little bit more enthusiasm. And on that note, one of the things that I did pick up was a signed copy of Young Mungo. So I queued up for, I think, about 40 minutes in the baking sun just to get him to write my name in this book. He was a really lovely guy, super friendly, and he's won me over to the extent where I've even bought a book with one of my least favorite trends in book publishing, which is these stupid short front covers with like some extra stats down the side. I hate it, it ruins books and it's really annoying. Did I get a bit ranty there? Sorry. There were two other books that I picked up while I was at the festival because it's a book festival and it feels stupid not to buy a few little titles here and there. But in my defence, they were both from the on-site Oxfam bookshop. So there was a huge number of tables of secondhand books arranged in all sorts of different categories. Uh, I obviously kept my eyes firmly on the fiction tables and I found two gems really. So when I buy secondhand books, I am a bit fussy about the condition of them and I like them not to have the spines too broken. Ideally, no like dog ears or anything like that. And these two that I've got are in near perfect nick, which is great. Funnily enough, they are both former winners of the National Book Award for Fiction. So first, I've got Shirley Hazard's The Great Fire. Shirley Hazard is an Australian author. I think she sadly died about five or six years ago. This was one of her later novels, and it took her about 20 years to write. The blurb is a little vague on what this is about, but it takes place after the Second World War, and I believe The Great Fire refers to the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And this is a bit of a globe-trotting book that moves around Asia and Europe and just sounds super interesting. It was also shortlisted for the Women's Prize or the Orange Prize, as it was called, back in 2004. But yeah, don't know tons about it, interested to read it, and I don't read enough Australian fiction. So maybe this will be an opportunity to put a few more pins in that part of the map. Then the other National Book Award winner that I picked up was Richard Powers' The Echo Maker. If you have been following my channel for any amount of time really, you'll know that I am a big Richard Powers fan book, and I've loved both of the books that I've read of his so far. This is a pretty chunky book actually, it's over 500 pages, not quite as long as the overstory, but it's about a man who is in an accident and he's in a coma for a short amount of time and when he wakes up, he is convinced that his wife is not his wife. He thinks she is like a facsimile, a complete imposter that looks and sounds like her, but isn't her. And when a doctor investigates this, what he finds apparently horrifies him. But what that is, I don't know. Powers is an absolute genius, so I imagine this is gonna have a little bit of big brain energy. And what I really like about this actually is when I was flicking through it, I found a bookmark on page 106. So I can see exactly where the previous owner of this book gave up with it. So I might leave that in there and see if I feel the same way at that point in the novel. Another one for the Chunksters TBR. Those were the three books that I picked up, but that did not stop me continuously 
popping into the on-site bookshop to have a little bit of a mooch and a little browse. It was very cool. There was an A to Z of books by all of the authors taking part in events or giving talks. And it just made you appreciate how many clever, creative people make this festival happen. And among all of those people were booktubers like me. And while I didn't get a chance to chat to any other booktubers, I did see quite a few other people there. So I've already mentioned that Jack Edwards was part of the Dua Lipa and Douglas Stewart event. And I did walk past him a little bit after that. And I almost said, congratulations and well done, but he was deep in conversation and I bottled it. But I also had a funny moment where I checked my emails and I saw that Simon Savage had commented on one of my old videos just to say, I think I've seen you in the bookshop, is it you? Now at this point I had left the bookshop but I had recently been there and I think I know what had happened. I was wandering around with my sunglasses on for quite a bit and when I went into the bookshop I had taken them off but I didn't have my normal glasses to hand to put on. So that meant two things. One, I didn't look like I normally do in my videos and two, I couldn't see a bloody thing so I didn't see him. Which was a real shame, it would have been lovely to say hello but I guess another time. I also know that Kieran from KD Books was there um, he's a Welsh booktuber so why wouldn't you go if it was on your doorstep? And actually I walked past another Welsh booktuber, Joel from Fictional Fates. So yeah, overall the vibes were immaculate. I absolutely loved the festival and I would definitely go back. Maybe next year, who knows? So yeah, another really long vlog. Thank you so much for sticking with it if you're still here. And if you did enjoy it, please do give it a thumbs up. Let me know in the comments if you've ever been to Hay Festival and what you thought of it. And if you've got any Irish fiction recommendations, please do hit me up with those. I'd love to hear them. I think that might be it for reading vlogs for a little while now. I've not got too much coming up that's very vlog worthy. But I have got lots of videos coming up soon, so if you'd like to be on board for those, then make sure you're subscribed and hit that subscribe button. But until next time, toodles!